Uh, I missed it again. Oh, that's okay, Mehdi. You'll get better if you keep practicing. Hey, if brain cells in a dish can do it, so can you. Uh, yes, that's very encouraging, Layla. After our conversation with Dr. Kagan, I just wanted to see if I could learn to play Pong as well as Dish Brain, but I'm not sure this is the hobby for me. I don't blame you, but why don't we take a break from Pong and tell our listeners what we're talking about? Welcome to Science Rehashed, the podcast where we offer a window into life science research to anyone in the world with an internet connection. I'm Layla. And I'm Mehdi. And we are your Science Rehashed co-hosts. We'd like to thank Untapped Resources for sponsoring Science Rehashed. Untapped Resources is a Boston-based foundation that funds the arts, sciences, education, and creative initiatives of people working to improve lives, celebrate community, and solve local problems. With support from the Untapped Resources grant program, we are committed to making science more inclusive and accessible for scientists and the science curious worldwide. We have a fascinating episode today featuring Dr. Vert Kagan, neuroscientist and chief scientific officer of Cortical Labs in Melbourne, Australia. Dr. Kagan and his team are working to build synthetic biological intelligence systems with the hopes of using them to better understand the state of the human brain. We interviewed Dr. Kagan to talk about their group's recent development, which they affectionately call DishBrain. With DishBrain, human and mouse-derived neurons were amazingly able to demonstrate goal-directed behavior by being trained to play a game of Pong. And with just a little feedback training, these neurons learned and got better at moving a virtual platform to bounce a ball back and forth. This is one of those discoveries that feels a little too futuristic for our time, and yet it's already here. We can't wait to share this conversation with you all and hear your thoughts on it. Are you left with more thoughts or questions after listening to a Science Rehash episode? Join us on Twitter at Science Rehash and leave your comments, thoughts, questions, etc. on the episode Twitter thread to rehash this episode using hashtag SR episode rehashed. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Kagan, to talk about a technology recently published by your group at Cortical Labs. We're going to spend some time talking about your incredible work that will make us all recalibrate our perceptions of what is possible when we combine technology and natural phenomena. But before we get into all of that, could you take a minute to tell us about your background and how you got to be in your current position? Yeah, sure. And uh, again, thanks for, thanks for having me on the show. So basically, I've, I've got quite a broad background. I was sort of one of those people who, who started with university, not entirely sure what they wanted to do. I started with law and psychology, and I thought maybe I'd do forensic psych or I'd do some sort of legal. And then I ended up being so totally fascinated once we started to do the more biological psychology and understanding how the brain worked. And so I transitioned, did an honors in cognitive psychology and a bit of neuropsychology focus. And then I went on and did a master's in neuroscience where I dived into the cell biology behind it all. After that, I went like deeper down that angle into a stem cell therapy based PhD program over at the Florey Institute down here in Melbourne. And then after that, I developed horrible allergies to rodents and could no longer work in, in animal models of disease with, with you know, therapies and preclinical models. So I branched out into bioinformatics and, and started to learn to, to do some you know, basic Python coding and algorithm development and did some regenerative medicine work around, around that. Uh, before finally this opportunity arose, which was just a perfect chance to actually almost bring it a full circle and go back around to how does cognition and intelligence arise? Uh, but at this now, instead of in the whole human, in this fundamental level of cells. And so that's kind of what, what led me to being, being where I am now, joining the company and yeah, what, what we're now focusing on. That is amazing. So it sounds like this project is sort of the culmination of your research path that has gone, you know, meandering around. Yeah, absolutely. And I often think about it and I think it, it is like almost like a microcosm of science because we often start out with a research question in science and we say, look, we want to investigate X and we go and we do a bit of work and we realize like by the end of it, we go, well, maybe X isn't actually what we're interested in at all. It's, it's Y or Z or and it can lead you down so many interesting directions. And I think it's like, it just shows the value of being quite flexible and being willing to build onto a new approach. 
And I think that sort of captures our general approach to science as well, just being, we, you know, we like to call it agile science, you know, being very flexible, very iterative in how we approach things to try and get to, you know, a goal that we needed. I'd love to really get into this amazing technology. Can you walk us through this physical setup so that our listeners can actually visualize what you mean when you say dish brain? Like, how is the chip connected to the computer and how is it communicating to and from the game of Pong? Yeah, so dish brain was just a little cute name we gave it. We used it in the paper to describe what we were talking about. It's not meant to be taken necessarily too seriously. It's just there's brain cells there in a dish, dish brain. The idea behind it, though, I think the key term that we're more focused on is this idea of synthetic biological intelligence. And there's sort of three pillars that hold up or allow SBI to arise. There needs to be the hardware, so a physical thing that can interact with the cells. There needs to be software, algorithms that actually give it stimulation, that type of stimulation. And most importantly, and I think this is where the field was a bit stuck previously, to do that with high resolution in real time, which is quite challenging. A lot of the work wasn't truly real time. Previously, it kind of had seconds of delay, depending what you're looking at. And there is some, you know, there's previous work that have been looked at building closed loop systems with some interesting results. And then finally, there's a synthetic biology, or what we, what we like to call wetware, for just the sake of consistency, hardware, software, wetware. And the nice thing with, with the uh, SBI technology is that there's been huge progress in all three of these, especially synthetic biology, over the last decade or so. So basically, SBI has these three things. And the idea of it is it's a way that you can elicit an intelligence or goal-directed response from a this system in a sort of dynamic and a responsive fashion. And we use the word sentience to describe this, much to some people were unhappy with that, let's put it mildly, but we don't define it, it's not consciousness, and we're really clear that it's not consciousness. What we're seeing is that we've got a dish here that can sense, because we're giving it information and it responds, so it seems to sense and respond, and it's doing that through a dynamic internal process. And that fits a formal definition an historical definition of sentience. It's only relatively recently people have conflated and said sentience equals consciousness. And so I think that's a really fascinating thing about SBI is it shows this adaptability that we just don't see and this self-organization that we don't see with traditional programming, you know, silicon programming. And before we get into the sentience topic, I really would like to talk more about the dish brain system. Normally in science, we try to solve a problem. So you essentially see these neurons in a dish, see these neurons in a dish and teaching themselves how to play a game of pong. This is obviously is really amazing technological advances. And but how can neurons learning how to bounce a ball off a platform help our society in the future? Great question, brilliant question. And that's really what we're all about. So there's kind of three perspectives, right? Short term. One of the most exciting like short-term applications is currently people do preclinical screening for drugs, for diseases, whatever the case is. They want to figure out like, let's say you've got a disease model, um, Alzheimer's for in your case. Alzheimer's I think would be incredibly tricky to tackle. But as an example, right, very tricky. But as an example, let's say you have this idea and you're like, oh, this drug might prevent whatever amyloid beta forming inside cell cultures, whether that's the right thing or not, <laughs> another question. But now, you can look at that in the cell culture and you can see, okay, yes, it does actually do something to, to the proteins or it does something to the, to the molecules or, or the expression pattern or whatever, whatever it is you want to look at. But for neurons, the purpose of a neuron isn't to express or not express a protein, right? It's not even just to fire and have activity or not have activity. The purpose of a neuron is to actually have function and to process information and do something with that information. So let's say you can do your assay now, and on top of that, you can add and say, look, when we give it this drug, is it still able to behave in a way that a process information in a healthy way? And that's something people haven't really been able to do before. And especially because previous work in this field has exclusively used primary cultures, you haven't been able to do a, a this is for the sort of closed loop system stuff, you haven't been able to even consider a personalized medicine approach. So let's say you now take from a patient with a, 
you know, genetic-based Alzheimer's disease, you culture their neurons, you can see how it changes the processing of information in these neurons over time, and then you could try and rescue that with some sort of drug, like that's an incredibly nuanced method that people haven't been able to do. And that's just the short term, that's just an example of the short term applications. I mean, going forward, you know, you can move away from this into considering these as a more of a biotic material. You know, neurons are a little device that are amazing at processing information. And they're incredibly power efficient, they're incredibly flexible and adaptable. So you use a system, what could you build with an intelligence that is low power, adaptable and efficient? Is it a I mean, as silly as it is, like people often say, could you put it in a Roomba? Maybe. Roombas work pretty well, but navigating its environment, like biology is great at navigating a dynamic environment. Is that an application in the future? There's so many of the same approaches and longer term than that, you know, once we, you know, can we extend beyond that? And I don't know how long term this is. What could a generalized intelligence achieve? And it's super exciting to think about, you know, and like an example I use for this is it doesn't even have to be human intelligence. At the moment, for someone who's visually impaired, a dog remains one of the best aids you can give somebody. And a dog still navigates an environment better than the best machine learning and a fraction of the energy cost. Even that alone would be an amazing application. But could it go further than that? Could it help relieve people who are currently working in dangerous jobs but require a human there for the dynamic real-time activity to respond? Potentially. There's just so many options that this could solve. We don't know yet. And that's just the, that's an exciting thing about it. We just don't know. Get to know our talented multinational team by following us on Instagram at science, no space rehashed, as we walk through our day-to-day tasks in an Instagram takeover and more. Our interests go far beyond science from illustration to bike riding and much more. So in the paper, you talk about this idea of variational free energy, and you talk about the processes a system has to display for it to be sentient. So like it has to be able to learn how external states and internal states influence each other, and it has to determine when to perform an activity and then assess how that action will actually impact these states. So can you tell us a little bit more about how you use these principles and the idea of minimizing surprise and why that's so important? Yeah, sure. So, so, big question again. Uh, the very short answer is, remember my phone grabbing example, right? I, I mentioned that before. So I reach and I grab my phone. There's a few things. If I am successful and I pick it up, right, what I've done is I don't truly see, perceive my phone, right? There's sensation that I receive, visual sensation in this case. There's visual information that, that I receive, Uh, I reach over, I try to pick it up. I'm successful in picking up the internal model that I generated of where my phone is and how to interact with it was accurate. Great. Let's say that I reach over to pick up my phone and I knock it on the ground. My internal model of where the phone is, how it is, and how I should interact with it is wrong. That is therefore surprising to me, right? So there's two things I can do. I can either get better at predicting, you know, updating what will happen when I reach for my phone i.e. I know if I reach for it, I'll knock it over, or two, I get better at controlling my actions to pick it up. These are really the only two options that can exist, so all we had to do was take one of those options away. So we took away the get better at predicting what will happen when you miss option. Because there's nothing to say that a neuro- group of neurons want to pick up their phone, or in this case, play pong. But there might be an inherent drive, according to the free energy principle, to minimize the the free energy or the surprisal or or whatever terminology you want to use. So that's what we did was essentially when they got it wrong, we gave them random information that they could not predict. Uh, Go, yeah, that's exactly, exactly. And that's what, and the results we saw sort of supported that, even to the extent I mentioned before about when you take away feedback, they still show like a very, very slight learning And that makes sense because when the game restarts, it's in a random position, the ball. So, so they, it's even that, even getting better, like slightly better in this uh, silent condition accords with it, but they wouldn't necessarily have the same driver as if you're actually throwing random information in. It's probably not as um, encouraging to them. 
encouraging, of course, is, is a euphemism, but it's not as encouraging to them probably, uh, you know, and not as big an incentive as if it's like just random information thrown in when they fail. So that was that was pretty neat to see that sort of nuanced effect because I think I think that makes it quite a strong argument seeing the nuanced difference uh, more so than if it was just black and you know black and white like learned or didn't learn completely. You and I receive feedback constantly. If I want to reach for my cell phone, I immediately as soon as my hand moves, I receive feedback, right? Visually, tactilely, I receive feedback. If I miss my phone, I risk that's feedback I receive. If I knock it off the table, that's feedback I receive. I know that if I want to pick up my phone in the future, I have to get better at controlling my body or better predicting that when I do reach for my phone, I will knock it on the ground and then modify my actions you know, accordingly. Even someone with severe sort of motor, motor neuron or whatever disease who might not have complete control of their body, they're able to at least predict that they're going to have that problem. So we never stop receiving. We never stop receiving feedback. And it's even visualizing it is impossible for us. We cannot, even dreaming, even sleeping, we have feedback coming in all the time because we have dense interconnected brains. So this embodiment, and that's where this term embodiment comes from, is 100% critical. And I think one of the biggest weaknesses of our work so far that we've been working on a solution for a while, and it's this perfusion circuit that I think we've mentioned a few times to people which will actually keep cells alive uh, at a controlled temperature, at a controlled uh, osmolarity, et cetera, for extended periods of time is going to help solve that. But one of the biggest weaknesses is that we were restricted to about 20 minutes of learning in a session and no more than about an hour and 20 minutes in any given day. Otherwise, you had evaporation, you had changes in osmolarity, and that killed the cells pretty quickly because you, you're ripping them out of their embodiment. It's totally alien. They're trying to rewire their circuits presumably there's some sort of you know basic plasticity going on suddenly they're ripped out of that and then they've thrown back in and they have to start again from scratch so that's one of the biggest weaknesses and something that we we will be solving or aiming to solve in the future i'm even just thinking about like when you were talking about this constant feedback i was thinking of those videos of astronauts when they come back down to earth have you seen those where they reach for you know, a pencil, right? And they're so used to, because they're spending, what, a year plus up in the ISS or wherever they are, right? And so they reach for a pencil and they write and then they just let go of the pencil and they're not used to the, like, audio feedback of hearing the pencil drop or whatever it is, right? And so then they go and reach for their pencil and it's not there. And they and you watch them, like, get that feedback over and over again. It's just not something that you think about every day, but it's something that's constantly happening. And I have another question that has to do with this idea, and it's a simple question, I assume, but maybe it has a more complicated answer. How do you define goal-directed behavior in a living creature? Yeah, so essentially goal-directed behavior is where there has been an external goal that's been defined, and you see the system is engaging or behaving or displaying responses in such a way as to lead to this result. And what, what that really means in a lot of ways is like, will it behave in a way that's otherwise arbitrary to its existing structure, but consistent with something external? So, for example, in our paper, the Pong, Pong playing, there's no particular reason that we're aware of that uh, cells should behave in the way that they behaved if they weren't trying to accord to the goals and we, we check that by obviously having a number of different control groups, right? And so the the direction of the goal was, the goal is an external source, right? And so the fact that they did modify their behavior in an otherwise arbitrary sense suggests that they are goal, goal directed by, by, the, by the system in response to its environment. How do you know the change in activity you are observing in your dish or in your culture is actually learning? We had a number of different control groups. So for example, what we did was, you know, we had really basic groups, like we just stuck media, the liquid that the cells sit inside, uh, into, and then we just tested, like, would media show this response? No, it didn't. Uh, then we tested to say, well, what if we actually have our system running, but there's no cells, we just have the paddle moved randomly? This was like our in silico test group. We were like, well, okay, just moving the paddle around randomly doesn't seem like it's learning either. Then we tested, we're like, all right, let's put actual cells down. Uh, see if the actual cells just without stimulation could control a paddle and show learning. 
because maybe there's just something inherent inside of the dish or inside the way that cells behave that accords with our program. I mean, it's incredibly hard to imagine what that would be, but let's make sure that's not happening. And again, that didn't show, didn't show learning. Uh, and then finally, what we could do is we could take like cells, you know, regardless whether it was mouse or as a human, and we could put them in there and we could say, all righty, give them information where the ball is, give them a feedback source, see if they would change their behavior to control the paddle to do better. And we saw that they did. And then we went further than that. And we actually said, well, is it actually our feedback that's controlling them? And this comes down to your question of goal directed. You know, what happens if we change the feedback? What if instead of putting information into the dish, we remove all information from the dish? Would that show some learning? Because this is a type of feedback too. They showed some result. And actually that in itself even accords with the theory we were testing. Because the theory suggests that what they're trying to do is create, uh, minimize the amount of like randomness. And each time the game starts, you get some random, random, uh, the ball position is random. So it can't be predicted. So even this idea that like we see a very tiny effect, it was, didn't actually show a learning effect over time, but it did end up slightly better than some control groups. But even that is like consistent with the theory of testing. And then when we took away the pairing between the predictability and the gameplay, right, to see is it like actually learning and responding or is it just something that makes it want to hit the ball without learning, uh, we saw that the learning disappeared completely. So uh, all of these sort of conditions led us to this conclusion that, learning is occurring and of course then there's count you know not countless but a large number of measures we check to see like electrophysiologically are they behaving in a way that would be consistent with this actually coming from the cells and again those were all like actually to be honest amazingly supportive <laughs> uh, i was we kept expecting to find something like totally bizarre we couldn't explain but the results look like you'd expect which from a science perspective uh, as, as you both i'm sure know is, is very pleasant when it occasionally happens. <laughs> if you're enjoying the show and want to help us keep making content, please consider becoming one of our patrons on Patreon. Find us at patreon.com slash join slash science rehashed to become a patron for just $3 a month. Or you can become a VIP patron for just $5 a month. Our first 10 VIP patrons will receive a free science rehash water bottle. That's patreon.com slash join slash science rehashed to join. I did want to ask another clarifying question, kind of big picture. You've talked to us about what synthetic biological intelligence means, right? SBI. Can you like explain to our listeners how it differs from artificial general intelligence or AGI, just as an overview? It, that's a really tough question in some ways because AGI doesn't exist yet I, I think like in in theory a true agi and sbi you know we don't have like a general sbi either of course we have like some really preliminary evidence but like let's say like sbi at its end goal and it might need a different name at that point and true agi they probably would be very close to indistinguishable we're talking about a system that can behave in presumably real time I think a lot of people make some good arguments that real-time embodiment will be necessary. I find those arguments convincing. Uh, it'll be able to behave in real time in an intelligent, adaptive manner to solve generalized problems, ideally without needing thousands of samples to do so. Like they should be fairly indistinguishable. They definitely don't need to display traits like consciousness, for example. There's no suggestion that consciousness is required for intelligence. Uh, they do need to be able to sense their environment and respond. But they honestly should be look pretty similar, a, like a true AGI and a true, you know, fully developed SBI should look pretty similar in how they behave and interact with the world. It's just the language is not developed yeah. for this. And so I can say one thing, but I'm just very cognizant, like many people will think, misunderstand and not in bad faith, but simply because we don't have the language to talk about these systems in a way that people can agree upon yet. Right. Like it's an incredibly nascent field. So you're still figuring out like what in terms of like yeah. the, the technology that's being developed. Right. So you still don't have I mean, heck, I'm in I'm in genomics and people still argue about what epigenetics means. Right. And that's been around far longer than uh, than this. And because it's such an evocative field as well, and it does tie to like very fundamental questions about what we are as as humans or as creatures even. Uh, there can be quite emotional reactions from people on a number of levels, but 
you know, the key thing I keep emphasizing to people is like, just because you have intelligence, it does not mean like necessarily that there's consciousness. And we have examples in like hard, hard examples, proof of like proof of point that intelligence and consciousness don't have to happen. So we use the example of blind sight as an example of this, if you're familiar with this. Say it again, of what sight? Blind sight. Okay. Yeah. So there's, uh, you, you, you'll, you'll certainly come across it in time, but there's, uh, uh, given given the field that you're in, uh, there's essentially yeah. this thing where if people have damage to certain areas of the visual cortex or the pathways mm. leading to the visual cortex. Their eyes can still function, but they do become legally blind. They become consciously unable to perceive any visual information. Yet, because there's other connections that lead to visual processing areas in the brain, like down in the brainstem, if you throw a ball at them or you put a chair in the way while they're walking, they can step around the chair and they can catch a ball. But then you ask them and you say, how? And with type 1 blind sight, they'll say, oh, well, it was chance. It was luck. I didn't see anything. I don't know how I did it. And so this is like almost like a little perfect example to say that they can engage in fairly intelligent, complex behaviors, you know, moving their hands in space to catch a ball. It's like a non-trivial task, uh, even if it seems trivial to us. Right. Without any conscious awareness of it. And so that's like a proof of principle. It's like intelligence does not have to have conscious perception or awareness. I see. And so like, like if you take a really simple, I, all right, I don't know if it's a simple example, right. But like think of a single celled organism, right. And like hemotaxis and it can move to an, to, towards away from stimuli. Right. And like, according, is that sentience or is that not really, is that just like a reaction, a chemically driven reaction to the environment it's in? I, I think it's, it, it depends on the details. Gotcha. Um, I think yeah. if it's if it's doing it as an, a whole organism in a way that requires it to uh, reorganize itself and, and behave in that dynamic fashion, I think it would qualify as a sentience. If I it's see. simply a bacteria following or, or a yeah. single cell following a chemical gradient, probably not. not. So and I think people often say, "Well, is a you know, uh, Andy often likes to say, "Well, is a, you know a um, what's a thermostat is conscious because it feels cold." <laughs> uh, which really oh sentient because it feels cold and it's like you know i disagree with that but it's quite hard actually to articulate why one disagrees with that and i think that the core thing was actually that hon came up with he articulated this wonderfully was he said well you have to program it it's following a programming and i think that's the same thing with the bacteria it's following some evolutionary programming to follow let's say a chemical gradient right with an sbi it's Yes, it has some programming in there in terms of how it's choosing to respond to one stimuli versus another in a certain way, but the system as a whole is reorganizing itself. And that's the difference between why my feeling of cold or your feeling of cold presumably is qualitatively different to what a thermostat is when it, you know, in brackets, feels cold. Very cool. That does bring me to some, like, kind of... 10,000 foot view kind of more ethical questions. Like, are there any ethical considerations that you think come along with developing a system using human drive neurons with the goal of sentience? There's always ethical considerations that should be taken into account for any science, right? Because we, you know, we've seen the results of when people don't consider ethics at all, even in sometimes basic science. And I could bring up examples, but it would all make us sad. So let's, let's not. Um, <laughs> what we, what I can say though, is we've like been really aware of this from the get-go. We've been working with independent bioethicists. In fact, our first paper, you know, so much that it was, you know, was a, actually a short commentary discussing the ethics of organoid research, uh, in the context of this approach. And, you know, essentially, uh, it's a tricky, it's a tricky, it's a tricky area, but there's no, there's no ethical barriers in place. And in fact, this, uh, synthetic biological intelligence SBI approach, I think, offers a lot of solutions to ethical problems that currently exist. For example, we brought up the Alzheimer's stuff. Uh, Medi's probably very familiar. Like a lot of the work people do in preclinical models, animal models, right? Now, that's not very pleasant for the animal, despite the best efforts that scientists make. I've been there. I've done it. We do our best efforts. It's. I'm sure the animals don't like. You know, it's not. We can justify and say, yes, it's worthwhile doing it because we're helping and saving lives or reducing human suffering. And in the end, that is like ultimately we raise that barrier and we say it's worth it. But surely moving towards a synthetic system that doesn't experience consciousness. And again, there's no evidence. We have been looking into markers of it. There's no evidence that there's any consciousness in these dishes. 
And their simplicity, they're so simple as a system. Uh, the only thing that compares to them is like Hydra, which most people don't even think of as, as having like a proper like nervous. They do have a nervous system. It's a very simple sort of flat nervous system, but no one really argued that they're conscious or worried too much about ethics. In fact, there are no ethics for these sort of things. There's not even ethics for most invertebrates. Most insect research in most places in the world, there's minimal to no ethics. Uh, and so if we can replace, let's say, complex animal models with this more specific model, that's a huge ethical gain. So speaking of this growing system, how complex do you envision the dish brain will be in the future? Honestly, this very much could be like the nascent computer industry. You know, when the silicon first transistor was made, you know, Shockley's transistor was made, it was janky and it was inconsistent and it was unreliable. And I think if you asked him, you know, where do you see this technology in 70 years, he might say better calculators or spreadsheets or, or if they would even think as far as that, I, I, don't, I don't know, I couldn't guess. Uh, maybe someone else knows the answer to what they would have said. But I definitely do not think they could have foreseen many thousands of these inside, you know, a device that we hold in our hand or the fact that they would be embedded in you know, nearly every device that I can reach here on my computer, you know, on my table, on my, on my computer setup. Where is this all going to lead? Who knows? But if we can come together and we can work on it, the applications and potential are so exciting. Like studying diseases, right? Like you think of our current models for a lot of neuropsychiatric disease, neurodegenerative disease, right, involves these animal models which don't exactly mirror human models and it takes so much like time and intensive work to get there right when what you're actually trying to get feedback on is like the synaptic connections or synaptic pruning or or this learning deficit or this whatever deficit right and and being able to have kind of a system that can learn and respond and then you can like edit or alter or or drug or do all these perturbations to it in in a relatively fast replicable way where you can actually see the synaptic connection is changing or see the, the change in memory. That's amazing. One of the exciting things is that we're actually going to be we're developing a system. There's kind of two approaches. One is an actual physical system. The other is actually a cloud-based platform that you can use and you can interact with these cells from anywhere in the world. So you said you're in, you're in Boston, right? So you can log on from there and you can go to the website and you can say, hey, I want to work with cortical cells or I want to work with hippocampal cells, whatever the, whatever the case is, depending, you know, we'll expand this as, as we grow. And I want to test to see uh, with this drug how they respond, or I want to test to see with this stimulation protocol how they respond. And you can do that. You can get the data delivered to you. Uh, and that's all handled, handled by us. You pay like a, honestly, a relatively small fee and you get your data and that's your question. You've got it. You've got the data right there and you can, you can investigate it. So yeah, I will say like as a plug, if people are interested, jump on the website, send in an, an uh, expression of interest because we will be selecting sort of key, key people uh, whose projects we think are the sort of the most viable for alpha testing in the re relative near future. Well, thank you so much for talking with us. This was absolutely fascinating. I'm sure it's going to lead to a fascinating <laughs> technology advances and also our understanding of the biological processes happen with the human body. And this is the beauty of working at the intersection of different fields and marrying the engineering, the artificial intelligence, biology, and making something outstanding. There is definitely so much on the horizon for a technology like Dish Brain. It sounds like it is going to open a lot of doors for future research. Definitely. It shouldn't be surprising that our neurons have this capacity for molding to the input we give them. Their plasticity allows them to be some of the most powerful cells in our bodies. But the fact that we can harness that learning power opens up a whole realm of possibilities in the future. It would be even more incredible if it would help me improve my own pawn game. I'm not sure anything could help you with that one, but let's keep practicing. Thank you for listening to another episode of Science Rehashed. This episode was written by Lauren Granada, edited by Vesna Ilieska and mixed by Aaron Troutman. 
The cover art for this episode was made by our creative director, Emma Brand. We'd also like to thank the whole team of Science Rehash for making this episode possible. Today, we're highlighting one of our Science Rehash ambassadors, Daniela Dominguez. Daniela is a Portuguese PhD student who studies decision-making processes under the influence of psychedelics. She's the president of Pint of Science Portugal, and in her free time, she loves either watching a good movie at home or having a party in the woods. Thanks for your hard work, Daniela. If you're interested in our ambassador program, find more information on our website, sciencerehashed.com.